That sounds like hi hippie talk. No, I think, um, uh, you know, I think that what what worship is, and we're, let's talk about worship leaders for a second. Like what a worship leader does is co-create in a uh, the natural climate in which people are most apt to encounter or have a lived experience of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit that will be transformative for them and will give them what they need to help advance the kingdom of God into the world. That was a mouthful for off the top of my head, wasn't it? But we want to create that ecosystem, that natural climate, right? The right soil for all that to happen. And also to awaken them to the urgent immediacy of God. That God is not a million miles away and we're trying to get him down here into this Walmart plus space where we're worshiping, right? We go up there. Yeah, or, yeah, I mean, we don't, we, we think that somehow or another that, um, uh, you know, okay, my job as a worship leader or my job as a liturgical assistant is I got to go grab God and bring him down into this space so that everyone can have a seismic experience uh, because that's what they came for. That's what they threw, you know, they came for a seismic experience of God. I mean, I'm being very cynical here, but, um, and, and I'm overstating things for the sake of illustration, but I do think that dynamic plays out in a lot of places. And here's two truths. Number one, God most often works very slowly. He's not seismic, right? I mean, God just does not act seismically in people's lives every week. It's very slow going. It's very quiet. Creeps along like a vine, you know. And um, so that's the first, you know, distortion I think that we're selling people. And I think the, um, the other thing is that we, um, we get into a situation where we have to keep amping it up, you know? It's like being a junkie. If you, you, if you take me to level six, if you give me three milligrams one Sunday and give it to me every Sunday for three weeks, come week four, I need three and a half, you know? You've gotta raise the production value of whatever worship experience I'm having. And again, this is what's so beautiful about the liturgy, about the Eucharist. It, it honors the fact that it's a slow, steady, you know, walk. And it's um, Abraham Heschel, you know, Joshua Abraham Heschel, the great uh, Jewish uh, theologian thinker, used to say, people come to me and they complain that the liturgy is, um, it's gotten boring, it's gotten rote. And he said, uh, well, have you become the liturgy yet? And they said, they get a little confused. He says, oh, well, I'll tell you what, when you become the liturgy, that's when, you know, we can stop doing that. And I think what he's saying is, it's like a golf swing, like, you know, once you hit 50,000 balls off of a, whatever you call it, you know, a driving range, and you no longer have to think, like when Christianity becomes an instinct versus something you have to think about doing, you know, that's when you know you've arrived at something beautiful. It's an instinct that just comes from you. Um, it, it to the point that it even surprises you, but it's, it's suddenly empathy emerges, compassion emerges, and love emerges, and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Well, it came from hitting 50,000 balls on the golf range. That's where it came from. It's in your bones, it's in your blood. how to get there? I showed up at the liturgy in the Eucharist every week. I kept telling the story over and over again until I became the story. And that, to me, is what um, is the slow, work of God um, in liturgy, you know, it's just keep showing up, keep telling the story, keep, keep going to the table, um, that to me is where, where it happens. May our hearts and minds be open to hear the word of God in Paul's letter. 
1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the, at the right time. For this, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Desire then that in every place the men and the women should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. This is the word of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Carol. Let us pray. Dear God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. May they be the beginning of peace and unity. In all your holy names we pray, amen. Well, if there was ever a week for prayer, it was this one. As Americans anxiously awaited the election results, many turned to prayer. I even know of a few agnostics who admittedly found themselves awake late at night, whispering to the ceiling, please, oh please, oh please, God, please, oh please. Now there's nothing wrong with prayers of petition. God knows our needs and heart's desires even before we ask. But it's still important to ask because by lifting up our desires in prayer, we unburden ourselves by handing them over to God. The liturgy of prayer, however, has the power to do so much more than to grant us our own small wants and needs. The liturgy of prayer, especially corporate prayer, group prayer, has the power to heal, unite, and create peace. And our world, especially our nation, needs healing and peace more than ever. Few will deny we have been torn apart by a frightening escalation of the politics of vitriol, division, and rancor. Prayer, however, has the power to counter these forces by changing us one heart at a time. When we pray, God transforms us cell by cell from the inside out. Every time we pray, we tend to the part of the earth that is us, the garden of our souls, becoming more compassionate, more peaceful, more patient and wise. Gradually, as our centering words say, we become the liturgy of prayer. And that goodness gradually ripples outward, as Emily's book said, to every person and to whom we have contact. And when we pray for the widow, the orphan, the refugee, we then open our eyes and arise from our prayer to see the widow, the orphan, and the refugee for whom we have just prayed. And we are then inspired to become the answer to our own prayers, to be the church to those in need. And when we pray for our enemies, those difficult people in our lives, the ones that don't think like us, don't vote like us. And yes, even that person who stands for everything you're against. When we pray for the other, we grow in peace, compassion, loving kindness. Prayer opens the eyes of our hearts to see there is no other, 
no separation between us and them. We are all but one family of God. In our scripture reading this morning, Paul urges us to blanket the whole world in prayer, saying, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, everyone, for kings and all all who were in high positions so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. Paul doesn't say, pray for the leaders you like, make intercessions for the good politicians, pray supplications for your political party. No, Paul says, pray for everyone for kings and all who are in high positions so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. And isn't that what we all want right now? To live a quiet and peaceable life together. Friends, no person is all bad and no person is all good. I tell my children this. And the enemy was never a them. The enemy is fear itself and fear lives within us all. And fear, dearly beloved, is an all too common feature of our liturgy of politics. Fear divides. Fear is antisocial. Fear will make you trample over the stranger, the poor and the sick in order to save yourself. Fear will cause you to pocket your values in order to save your pocketbook. A Christian liturgy, especially our liturgy of prayer, deprograms these strong cultural liturgies of fear and selfishness. And that's why we must come here to practice it again and again and again, hitting those 5,000 balls now more than ever. And even though we are physically distant now, prayer brings us together in spirit. On Tuesday, I prayed together with many of you via live stream as we took deep breaths together around coffee and candles, easing our election day anxieties. On Thursday, I prayed with parents of bless this mess as we gazed and marveled on the beauty of jellyfish floating across our screens. Through hymn singing, I prayed by candlelight with several members of our congregation outside the Devers window in Cindy's last days. And on Friday, I was blessed to pray again at her bedside the hour before God welcomed her home. And throughout the week, I spent many moments in prayer in our outdoor sanctuary by simply marveling in the beauty of God's creation and soaking up its peace. So I wanted to share this sacred space with all of you this morning and encourage you to make it your own, especially while this indoor sanctuary is closed. So I invite you to join me there now as we practice together what we preach, coming together across time and space in a liturgy of corporate prayer, a guided prayer for the healing of God's family. Good morning. I greet you from the outdoor sanctuary at United Christian Church of Austin. Our church building may be closed, but this space, this outdoor sanctuary, is open to you and your family if you need a sanctuary, a place to come for peace. Uh, thanks to Rowan Whipple, his family, and all the volunteers who clean the space up to make it available for you. So please join me now in the corporate act of prayer. <laughs> Every human being is made in the image and likeness of God. We are each, therefore, a precious child of God, 
who is both a mother and father to us all. So let us live out this loving truth that each of us is part of one family, the family of God. Bring your focus to your heart, which is the very center of you. Sit in a comfortable position, back tall. Take three deep breaths, feeling breath, ruach, which is the Holy Spirit moving within you. Breathe in deep, breathe out long. Breathe in deep, breathe out long. One last time, breathe in deep, breathe out long. Take a moment to connect with God and feel God's presence right here and right now. Open your heart to receive God's love, compassion, and grace. Visualize God's warm love filling your heart. Once you feel God's love filling you, begin praying these words inwardly. May I be blessed, and may I be a blessing to the whole family of God. May I be blessed, and may I be a blessing to the whole family of God. Now gradually let the love of God that you have cultivated within you begin to spread, filling the whole room. Spread God's warm love further, calling to mind a beloved person in your life. Bring the image of their face to your mind's eye now and let God's love pour from you into them as you pray. May my beloved be blessed and may my beloved be a blessing to the whole family of God. May my beloved be blessed and may my beloved be a blessing to the whole family of God. Continue to cultivate God's warm grace and loving kindness, spreading it to your church family now, blessing everyone who is worshiping with you now across time and space, praying, may our church family be May our church family be a blessing to the whole family of God. May our church family be blessed. May our church family be a blessing to the whole family. Now feel God's love multiplying and spreading and washing over the entire city of Austin, blessing everyone in our city, no matter who they are or what they have done. Praying together now, saying, may our neighbors be blessed. May our neighbors be a blessing to the whole family of God. May our neighbors be blessed. May our neighbors be a blessing to the whole family of God.
Let God's compassion gather strength within you, growing and healing all of God's children across our state now, healing the wounds inflicted by our politics of division, praying and saying, blessing each person across our state, saying, may our fellow Texans be blessed. May our fellow Texans be a blessing to the whole family of God. May our fellow Texans be blessed. May our fellow Texans be a blessing to the whole family of God. Keep spreading God's love with this prayer, this powerful prayer, covering our entire nation now with God's love and grace, praying for all of God's children, the whole human family across our entire country, asking we be freed from division and conflict, a politics of fear. With this prayer, praying together, may our fellow Americans be blessed. May our fellow Americans be a blessing to the whole family of God. May our fellow Americans be blessed. May our fellow Americans be a blessing to the whole family. And finally, together let us bless the whole world with God's love, spreading warmth and light from our hearts across all creation, praying, may all God's children be blessed. May all God's children be a blessing to the whole family. May all God's children be blessed. May all God's children be a blessing to the whole family of God. May this prayer be the beginning of more peace, more unity, more love and grace and light in this world. Amen.